Well, good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, we come uh, entering your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, with, with joy at uh, just all of the blessings as we consider this life, and uh, uh, even this single day, and just how well taken care of we are, and just uh, how you look down upon us uh, and uh, provide so much, all that we do, and all that we are, and the opportunities that we have, the challenges that we face in just uh, so many ways. You, you bring us your goodness and your benevolence. Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you're with us as we study your word, as we pick it up and, and take from it the, the lessons that uh, are necessary for us to, to live and have that life abundantly. Heavenly Father, give us the wisdom to, to see the wholeness of your message, to embrace it, and put it into practice uh, each and every day, especially as we consider the, the these parables that, that your son spoke about those who were lost, our proper attitudes, and just how we can uh, win and influence many to you. Heavenly Father, we, we ask uh, especially a prayer for our, uh, all those of our number who uh, are sick, undergoing difficulties, facing uh, challenges that uh, have kept them away. Give us uh, the opportunity to, to be there for them, to, to rejoice with them when they overcome, to mourn with them when they need to mourn, to listen when they simply need us to listen, and, and always encourage and strengthen. Heavenly Father, we thank you especially for your Son who went to a cross and, and gave his life as a sacrifice for us so our sins could be taken away. And we can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. It's in his name that we pray. And amen. All right. We are in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And we started kind of at the beginning of the chapter last week. Uh, and uh, just made uh, mention, we'll just give kind of a brief synopsis here up front, but made mention of the fact that uh, this is a, a chapter that's not only full of parables, but it is also a chapter that's full of parables that kind of run along the same theme. Uh, many of them are, are kingdom parables, and we know that when Christ taught uh, in parables that much of what he said um, had to do with the kingdom. Uh, and uh, he says so, uh, or says as much. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, or uh, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven will be, or the kingdom of heaven, and he says that a good bit. Um, but uh, in um, this particular case, uh, we, we see another type of, of scenario <clears throat> where uh, Christ uh, is in the midst of uh, kind of a confrontation. Uh, and we see parables uttered uh, at this time uh, as well. Uh, begin uh, the chapter by saying, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Uh, and then, uh, based upon based upon that reaction, uh, based upon this call it condition of heart, uh, Christ is then going to tell uh, three parables uh, that all kind of go together uh, and touch on the same subject, uh, but approach it each uh, time in a, in a little different way. Now, last time we talked a little bit about the uh, parable of the lost uh, sheep. Uh, in the parable of the lost uh, coin, uh, pointed out some of the differences between uh, the two uh, and discussed uh, essentially the, the main uh, idea for each one uh, of those particular parables and uh, had a lot of good conversation uh, about what each one of these uh, particular parables mean. Uh, for instance, uh, when it came to the parable uh, of uh, the lost uh, sheep, uh, we, we noted very clearly that, uh, you know, the, the shepherd leaves the 99 behind and he goes out, uh, he finds the sheep, throws it on his shoulders uh, uh, and returns uh, and rejoices. Uh, and he throws a party and that party uh, is amongst people, uh, you know, here on earth. Uh, there's a celebration here on earth. But then when we get to the parable of the coin, it ends by saying that there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who uh, repents. Uh, so when people come uh, from or, or when the lost uh, is found, uh, and make no mistake about it, we're talking about people. Uh, and that's what Christ is you know, talking about here. He, he's not talking about, you know, 
uh, actually losing a coin or actually losing a sheep. Uh, that's just simply the story uh, that is supposed to mimic um, the real life situation of people uh, being lost. Uh, but uh, there is rejoicing both on heaven uh, and uh, both in heaven and uh, on earth. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of other points that were brought out as well. But uh, we want to kind of move on and get to the third parable uh, in the series. Uh, and it's the one that most of us um, know best. Uh, it's the parable of, and if your Bible reads like mine, uh, it says the parable of the prodigal son uh, as kind of a heading. Uh, and um, let's just go ahead and read it first. Uh, and then we'll uh, come back and kind of visit some of the uh, the larger facts about it. It's the longest of the three uh, and um, tells a little bit more uh, of the story, you, you know, about why um, uh, why the son was lost. We, we don't know why the sheep was lost. Um, we can kind of make a guess that it was out of ignorance, um, as was pointed out last week. We really don't know why the coin was lost, though we can probably conclude that it wasn't on purpose. Uh, it was probably just simple carelessness uh, that it was lost. Uh, we know more of the backstory uh, for the prodigal son, uh, so it's a little bit longer. But let's go ahead and read it, and we're going to begin at verse 11. We are in Luke 15. Luke 15, beginning at verse 11. <clears throat> And he said, of course, the he here is Jesus. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into the far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods of the pig, the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will rise, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on, on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the older son was in the field and he came and he drew near to the house and heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what, thing, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in, and his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who <clears throat> was, uh, has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have, all that is mine, is yours. I was fitting, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost uh, and is found. Okay. All right, so just a couple of observations, but let's begin with the, uh, the kind of obvious. Um, we notice that the word prodigal is never used in the parable itself. Um, what does it mean to be prodigal? Why do we call him the prodigal son? Hmm? Wayward? 
So prodigal is not a word that we use anymore nowadays. Um, it's not a word that, I mean, as a matter of fact, have you ever heard anybody use this word outside of the telling of this story? I've never heard anybody use it. I mean, any time they ever talk about prodigal, uh, they're either referring to this parable uh, or quoting this parable or telling this parable or something related to this uh, parable. Uh, because most of us know, as soon as we hear prodigal, we think, oh, Bible, prodigal son. Um, surely. Could be like wasteful? Yeah, it, it means wasteful. Uh, it, means, uh, it means wasteful. If you go back in, in, um, if you go back in the context... Uh, and you read um, down to about verse 13, and there he squandered his property property in reckless living. Um, squandered and reckless living. Uh, that's where we get the word prodigal from. Um, it's wasteful and um, kind of squanderous living. Uh, that's, what, that's what it means. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's how we kind of define this fellow. So he's, he's off. Um, and he's wasting, uh, and he's squandering that which was, you know, the father's. All right, so we read the parable. We know what prodigal means. Um, what's the point of the story? What's the point of the story? Well, this is one of those stories that has a couple of different points, right? Uh, because we have, um, we have a couple of different characters that we end up interacting with. Um, of course, you, you have the, the, the prodigal, uh, and then you have the older brother, uh, and there are at least one point, there's at least one point, uh, main point, that's associated with each one of them. All right, so, you know, there can be multiple answers here, um, but I think, um, well, here are the story without you. What, what do you think is the, are the main points uh, of, the, of the parable? Shirley? Okay, forgiveness following repentance. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's certainly one of the messages, if not one of the main messages. Okay, anything else? The younger son, the prodigal son, he goes looking, searching for happiness, not realizing that he was better off where he was. And, uh, he sees the emptiness of all those other things. He comes to himself and he wants to go back. Okay. Even as a servant, he would be happier than he was in his presence. Okay. Yeah, very good. Chris. And the older son was self righteous. The older son did not want to forgive the younger son. Yeah. And, and the older son uh, is kind of the. How you want to put it? He, he provides for us the contrast um, that helps us better understand uh, the message of the prodigal son. Uh, he he is sort of the the black backdrop to uh, that um, you know necessary item that we're trying to sort of bring into focus uh, and um, you know see very very clearly. Uh, but uh, you know just to kind of jog our memory if you go back to the to the beginning remember he's talking about the he's talking to the pharisees and scribes uh who are complaining that he is sitting and he's eating with sinners okay sitting and he's eating with sinners uh so he's telling these three stories uh to you know give them a message of some kind uh to teach them uh you, you know a lesson of some kind uh, and, and i think um and we can kind of tack on all the extraneous points, you know, here to this. Uh, but I think uh, the, the message, if we put them all kind of sandwiched together uh, of the prodigal son, uh, is that, yeah, people sin, but people are also forgiven. Uh, except for those, uh, except for those who, you know, take for granted, if you want to put it, you know, that's probably watering it down a little bit, um, but take for granted, you know, the the blessings of knowing God, uh, and I think that's I don't know, I, making it as short as, as possible. Uh, I think that uh, the story of the prodigal and the older brother 
uh, can be kind of summed up that way. Well, you know, you call these people sinners over here um, as if they could never be forgiven, as if that's their continual state. But they will be forgiven. Uh, They will be forgiven uh, as opposed to, you know, the self-righteous who, you know, we get to the end of the story and there's nothing good that's said about them. Nothing good that's said about them. Uh, So uh, aside from that, the the main points here, then let's kind of go to the parable itself and break it down. Um, We know that there's a father. And the Father, like many of our parables, represents God, right? Okay. Uh, the parable uh, in the parable, and there's you know God, and, and He is you know the Father. Um, before we get to the other ones, let's just take a look at how God's presented here, uh, because this is um, you know we know this as the parable of the prodigal son, um, but I think as, as many people have pointed out. Uh, and, and they've pointed out for a long, long time. I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, most of your commentators um, and um, you know, people will tell you that it's really less the story of the prodigal son and, and more the story of the loving father. Uh, but, you know, go through the parable and let's just run through it very quickly uh, and, and look at this character uh, that is called, you know, father, who we know represents um, God. So there is a father. <clears throat> there is a father, and he has these two sons. The younger comes to him and uh, uh, asks for the property that's coming to him. Uh, and then you'll notice it says, and he divided the property uh, between them. Okay? Now, does that tell us anything about the father? And what does it tell us about the father? He was very loving. Very fair. Okay, well, he's dividing it up. You know, you know, he didn't, um, you know, we don't know anything more than, you know, he's dividing this up. Uh, but it does say something about uh, the father. Uh, someone else had their hand up. Carol? No? Yeah, okay, he's fair and he gives to his children equally. All right, very good. Now, uh, if you think about that, oh, go ahead, Philip. The other thing is that it's before, before time to really give it up, that wouldn't really happen until after he was dying or on near death. You know, the younger son comes and asks for his portion early. Right. And Yeah, if you uh, you know, take a take a look at verse uh, twelve again, um, and just kind of look at it. Notice he says, "Give to me the share of property that is coming to me." Uh, and um, you know, if we know anything about uh, the, the way things kind of operated in their society, uh, we realize that you know there was a blessing that was given by fathers for sons. Uh, and that blessing wasn't necessarily given in equal portion. Um, who received the greatest portion? The oldest son. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's recorded all throughout the scripture. Uh, the oldest son received uh, the greater share, the lion's share of, you, you know, the, the, the father's, you know, wealth. Uh, but it never really mentions that here in the story. Um, but the, son, the younger son would have received, you know, something. Uh, but that blessing uh, and uh, any kind of inheritance that would have been gained from the father would have come after the father was dead. You know, he, once the father died, you know, then uh, that inheritance. And of course, you know, we understand that today uh, as well. That's one of those things that kind of continues, uh, you know, continues on. So, you know, it can't be kind of like the, the youngest son coming to him uh, and saying, well, you know, I know you're not dead yet, but you're really not long, long for this world. So why don't you just go ahead and give me what, you know, uh, what you would give me after you were dead? I, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, you talk about being offensive. Um, 
you know, that would be a highly offensive thing. Uh, and, and yet, we, we don't see any kind of rebuttal. Um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of, well, that's not the way things are done, or that's improper, or I'm offended. Uh, the, the Father gives it to him. The Father gives it to him. Uh, which tells us that, you know, he's not just benevolent. Uh, he, he's doing a kindness here that ran 100% against the societal norm. This is not how you did things uh, back then. This was not the way, it's not even society. This is not the way families operate. Uh, and yet the father went ahead uh, and gave it. To him. All right, so keep reading, uh, and you find out a little bit more. <clears throat> yes. Well, I mean, it looks that way. Um, of course. You know, the youngest, uh, the older doesn't leave. And then later on, he makes the statement that, um, you know, son, you were always with me and all that I have, uh, all that is mine is yours. Uh, it was fitting to celebrate, you know. So you have that conversation between the father and the older brother, you know, late in the story. Right. Uh, well, let's see. The, the, let me, here we can check. Um, the ESV says, and he divided his property between them. Um, you know, the ASV uh, says he divided unto them his living. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's obviously plural. Uh, but is there a way you could divide it out without dividing it between them? I mean, I, I don't necessarily think, I mean, it, to me, by the time you reach the end of the parable, what you realize is that, um, yeah, he divided out that son's portion, um, and what was left would have been the other son's. Uh, but the other son did not avail himself of that, uh, but instead stayed with the father. Um, and it looks like he stayed with him, not necessarily for good purposes, um, but, um, you know. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it'd be hard if you had two sons to give one son his portion w without saying this is your portion. That makes sense? Yeah, o otherwise it wouldn't be dividing it. It would just be arbitrarily choosing some chunk of something and, you know, w which is also very telling. Um, you know, because he could have come to the father and the father could have said, well, okay, I really don't feel like giving you anything, but um, here's the token couple thousand dollars go on your way and you know but the father was concerned about the portion you know it looks like he did what the son requested give me what would have fallen to me and he gave him what would have fallen to him um, which would have been the fair portion Shirley Well, we'll get to that. Um, you know, it's uh, I mean, it's obviously you know, it's a parable, right? So, I mean, you, you know, we're not talking about literal dollars and cents and things like that. Uh, so that'll be one of our questions. You know, what, what exactly are we talking about? But um, let, let's run through the father real quick uh, and just uh, look at him again. Um, the son's estimation of the father is that uh, his father's servant uh, is benevolent to even, or his father is benevolent to even the, uh, even the servants in, in his home. He even treats them uh, fairly. He remembers that good treatment uh, when he's eating the pig slop. Uh, and um, it's the thing that kind of wakes him up and drives him home. Um, he remembers he had it good, you know, when he was living with his, uh, you know, father. Um, he goes to his father, and of course, uh, he tells him he's sinned. Uh, he doesn't want to be called a uh, son, but uh, instead a servant. Um, and then uh, verse 20, uh, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, uh, felt compassion, ran, uh, embraced him, 
and kissed him, uh, and then not only had a feast, uh, but, uh, you know, he gets the best robe, puts a ring on his hand, puts shoes on his feet, um, and then they all celebrate. Uh, and each one of those things, you, you know, tells us a little bit about the Father uh, and uh, just how benevolent and how good and how loving, uh, how kind uh, this, you know, uh, th this Father was. Uh, and of course, we know that uh, about our God as well. You know, God is love and from him flows, you know, all blessings uh, beyond what you know, we would even imagine is, is or should be the case. You know, our love typically goes up to a point, right? And then we tend to kind of, you know, pull back on it. Uh, but with God, I mean, this son comes to him and wishes he was dead, and, and yet he still gives to him. He disappears into the far country for a while uh, and lives and wastes all that the father, you know, had. It wasn't his. He didn't earn it. He didn't make it. There was nothing he did uh, that we know of that, aside from just simply being a son, uh, that earned these goods or possessions or money, uh, and yet the father doesn't seem too concerned about that when the son comes home. He's just happy he came home. Uh, and he runs to meet the son. Now it says that he saw the son, uh, which may seem to indicate that he was looking for the son to come back. Uh, you know, he didn't write him off. He, he wasn't, you know, surprised or shocked when he saw the, the son coming far off. Uh, it makes it sound as if the father was looking for him. You know, he saw him while he was still afar off. Uh, you know, and chances are that's the case. He, he was looking for the son to come home, waiting for the son to come home. Uh, and of course, we understand that growing out of God's love is this desire that all men come, that all return uh, and, uh, you know, make their lives right and, and live, you know, for him and embrace the salvation that he offers. Um, when they come, he, he runs to meet him. He, he doesn't wait for, for them to come. Uh, the father says, uh, I'm going to run out. Uh, I'm going to, you know, take with me the robe and the ring. And, you know, all of that uh, is kind of symbolic for a, a number of different, you know, things uh, that would have indicated, you know, his full acceptance back into um, that household. You, you know, he left, he was a son, he comes back and he's going to get treated like a son uh, because he came, <clears throat> because he came uh, back. Uh, so the more time we could dig deeper into the father, but I mean, uh, the, the father is just this, uh, you know, amazing character that the more you look at him, uh, the more amazing uh, he becomes. Uh, and uh, of course, that's uh, our amazing and awesome God uh, who, you know, invites all people to come uh, and be a part of his household. All right. So we have the younger son and then we have the older brother. Uh, now we know the father is God. Who are those two? Younger son, maybe the Gentiles? What about the older brother? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you, you can probably find both in, in the interpretations. Usually if you're going to say one is Gentiles, then the other one would be the Jews. Um, on the other hand, since he is talking to the Pharisees and scribes, uh, it, it might be, and of course this is going to apply, it's just a little bit more specific. Uh, than the previous one. Um, you could say sinners and tax collectors uh, are the prodigals, uh, and the older brothers are the Pharisees and the scribes. Um, they're the ones that, you know, <laughs> because we're Jews and because we have the temple and because we have this, you know, um, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we deserve this. You, you know, uh, it's ours and, uh, you know, all, so on and so forth. Um, so he's telling them this parable, and uh, the, the, the point, I believe, is that, uh, you know, again, you're calling these people sinners, um, but in reality, you know, they come home, they're going to be forgiven uh, because they see the error of their ways. Uh, they, they see, you know, because uh, of the way that, you know, uh, life has gone for them, 
uh, just how much they should be appreciating the Father's house. Uh, you all have been here, and you're taking the whole thing for granted. You know, you're just assuming that you're sort of grandfathered in, uh, and you have this just puffed up self righteousness about you. Um, that's going to cost you your souls. Uh, I think the point that he's trying to make to them. Now, we kind of alluded to that in, in the coin and the sheep uh, just a little bit, but here, um, I think it's just full blown. He's just flat out telling them, uh, you know, in, in that picture of the older brother that. You guys are missing it. You know, you, you, you think you're in the father's house, but you're not any closer than the prodigal was in the far country. You know, and, and you need to get things right, uh, essentially, is what he's telling them. All right. So uh, what are some of the, uh, the main, well, not main points, but what are some of the lessons that, that we can learn from the, the story of the, the prodigal son? It's just a go ahead, Shirley. Shirley and then Jeannie. I was going to say about the happiness that there is. You make they you heard in the Bible that when one sinner is brought to repentance and salvation, that the angels in heaven even celebrate with such happiness. And so this was the same happiness that the father was feeling when his son finally came to himself. Okay. All right, yeah, there's a, there's a happiness here. You know, it seems like, um, you know, I mean, things don't go right. Uh, things don't go right. Uh, and, you know, the son's not supposed to come and ask this. He's not supposed to go to the far country. And he's not supposed to have all those bad things happen to him. Um, but in the end, you, you know, when we, when we find God uh, and, and we appreciate who he is, there is joy beyond measure. So yeah, in many, many ways, it's a story of great happiness. Okay, Jeannie? Love and forgiveness, of course, you know, those are there, embodied in the Father. Uh, you, you know, I mean, and if you put uh, grace on top of that, yeah, I think you would have probably the whole, you know, the whole picture of what, uh, you know, how God is depicted here. You know, he gives even when there's there's no no reason to. You know, the son didn't earn it. And here, here here's the thing uh, that um, here here's the thing that that really really speaks to the to the graciousness uh, of God is that when the son came the first time and asked, did he earn what he got? No, father didn't know it to him then. You know, so when he comes the second time, did he deserve it then? No, he certainly didn't deserve it then. So there's no point in this story at which the son really receives anything based on his own merit. You know, now, uh, you know, lest, uh, <laughs> lest we be proponents or advocates of that whole, you know, well, you know, say by grace only and you don't have to do nothing idea well no the prodigal came home you, you know he, he had to come home if he'd have stayed in the far country he'd have been just as lost as anybody else you know there's a balance there to strike even, even in the parable of the prodigal it, it's implied that well just like James says faith without works is dead uh, you know so you can't go to the prodigal and you know make that claim that you know, we got grace, we got everything. Um, so, yep, Phil. You see that the younger son, after he repents, he humbly comes back to the father. And you see that the difference between the older son is not, is not humble in his dealing with his father. So there's that contrast there. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I we were, I've referred to it a couple of times. There, there are some some notes that come in a PDF, and if anybody wants those, uh, they weren't produced by me. Uh, I'm using them a, a little bit as we go along, but they're very good. Um, but they kind of bring out this this point about the older brother, uh, and they take it to the point where, uh, and um, I read it from there, and then I went and looked it up in other sources, and 
it, it turned out to be true, but uh, in most cultures uh, of this time, uh, the, the norm would have been that if, if the older brother came home and he saw this happening for the younger brother, uh, that he would have then become the master of ceremonies. He would have been the guy who would have led um, this celebration, uh, this celebration. Uh, but that's not what we see in the older brother. You know, we don't see any celebration at all. All we see is envy and strife and jealousy and, and you know, why are you doing it for them? And they're not deserving and they're not worthy. And, and you know, how can they be trusted? And you, you can just about hear it. Uh, and um, it's funny. It's been a while since I've done the actual word study. But do you notice what the brother says about the older brother says about the younger brother? Your son. Yeah, he doesn't even call him brother. He says he's, you know, your son. Uh, but here, go over here and read. There, there's something that's kind of telling in it as well, even with this specific language. He says, uh, look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never came to me, uh, never gave to me a young goat that I might celebrate with, um, you know, uh, my, <clears throat> uh, my friends. Um, hold on. I skipped right over it. Yeah, yeah, devout, yeah. But uh, when this son, yeah, but when this son uh, of yours comes home, uh, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, uh, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now, where in the previous part of the story do we read anything about devouring your wealth with prostitutes? Well, it says he lived recklessly. You know, I mean, if you go back. It says that he squandered and he lived recklessly, but it never mentions anything about, you know, the specifics of prostitutes. Uh, and, and, you know, while that might be the case here, um, it, it kind of seems like, you know, the older brother is just looking at the younger brother and uh, making some assumptions. Uh, you know, how do we know any of that? How did the brother know any of that? As a matter of fact, he was out in the field. He just came in. He heard the party and refused to go in. How did he know? Yeah, lipstick on his cheek, lipstick on his cheek, <laughs> <laughs> on his tunic, <laughs> or whatever. He... <laughs> Checked his Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I mean, it just—I uh, mean, the brother is just seemingly going out of his way to find anything, even to the point of, of what may be false accusations here. Uh, to, to convict the brother and convince, you know, the father. Um, which goes so well, does it not, with the Pharisees and the scribes, you know, who went out of their way so many times uh, and, and inserted all of these, you know, fault, even with Christ himself. When they could find no fault in him, what did they do? Well, they just made up stuff. You know, let's go hire a guy and he'll come and say this. You know, uh, they did the same thing. They did the same thing. A uh, couple more things we need to go over about the, the prodigal, but that's our second bell. So we'll kind of pick up there next time uh, and then, uh, you know, move on. Okay, good. Appreciate everybody's input. Most people have bucket lists. Things that you want to do before, you know, you leave this world, Right. My list looks a little bit differently. You ever see those commercials? Maybe, I don't know if they've been on in a while, but uh, the commercials, I think it's for an insurance company where mayhem yeah. comes to play. That's what my list looks like. <laughs> Especially when I get behind the wheel of a car. I I'm pretty much convinced that somewhere, somebody has it out for me. And, and they are simply running down that list of mayhem type things uh, and exacting them upon me for some reason. This morning, yet again, I was hit. I, I've been hit in more auto accidents 
Since we've come to Florida, then probably everybody in my family put together. Three times on my motorcycle, two times in my truck, one time in my van. This morning, I'm coming out of car circle, basically, minding my own business, driving up the road, and a girl just makes a left turn right into the side of me, out of nowhere. And of course, I didn't say anything, and I was pretty proud of myself, actually. I kept my calm, and, and uh, the young girl was just freaking out and telling me the story about how she had to put down her dog the night before, and it, it was just, uh, I'm sitting there feeling horrible for her, and she just slammed into me. Accidents happen, right? There's nobody out to get me, and we just live in a world where those types of things happen. Although I did think it's strange when on our way here tonight, I saw three other auto accidents. One I saw actually occur right in front of us. But it just reinforces. We live in a world where accidents happen. We live in a world where things happen that sometimes bring us pain and difficulty and, and, and struggle. But the more I thought about that, and the more I thought about it, especially right after that accident happened this morning, realizing that nobody got hurt and realizing that you know, it's just a, the vehicle and the important thing is that, you know, no one was injured. Have you ever noticed that there's no accidents with God? I mean, there aren't even happy accidents with God. At least it's never presented that way in Scripture, is it? It's not as if we're told the story of Joseph, for instance, and about how God was with him, and he was with him in the pit, and he was with him in the prison, and he gets all the way up to the end of the journey, and Joseph doesn't come out and say, you know, all of these things, while intended as bad from you, were just really happy accidents from God. It's never depicted that way in the scripture, is it? And I was reminded again of this idea when we came to our adult class in here this evening and we were talking about the parables of Luke 15 and how things get lost. And one of those parables is the parable of the lost coin. And we can assume that the woman who owned this coin who, that would have treasured it like an heirloom didn't intentionally put it someplace where it couldn't be found. But that perhaps by accident, it was lost. And then she had to go in search of it. But when it comes to God's side of the equation in all three of these parables, when it comes to the being found part, it's never an accident. It's always a very deliberate thing which I don't know about you, but gives me comfort. You see, when my life is a mess and it's out of control and I'm out here causing accidents, I didn't cause any of those accidents in a literal way. When I'm out here kind of messing things up, see, God's got it all under control. God's got it all within his care. He answers our prayers. He provides his providence. And the New Testament tells us that he even has the numbers of our what? Hair. Or our hairs on our head, excuse me, numbered. Our God is a truly amazing, amazing God with whom there is no accident. But it also tells us something else. When it comes to your soul, God is actively pursuing you. If his son is not proof enough of that, then I don't know what is. He sent his son to what? Seek and save that which is lost. Now you can call your being lost an accident all you want to. And maybe it was somebody's fault and maybe it was ignorance like the sheep and maybe it was just willfulness like the prodigal. Maybe it was carelessness of somebody else in their speech or their words or whatever. But know this and know it for sure that God is pursuing you. He seeks all to give them his salvation. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I love the way that the story of the, the prodigal depicts the father. When the son is coming home from having been in that far country and he's eating of the food that the pig would eat and he remembers the goodness of the father and he starts on his way home, you can almost see it in, in your mind. As the son goes home, he's rehearsing, what am I going to say? How can I get back in the good graces of my father? And he, and he says some of that here. Father, I sinned against you and I'm not worthy to be a son. You know, just make me a servant and, you know, just a place to live. And, you know, he's running through all of that. But his father doesn't even let him get near the house. Father sees him from afar off and the father runs to him. Your God pursues you. Yeah. If you ever have a chance to read it, and just a little plug here. There's a book written by a guy by the name of Eddie Cloer. It's called Will God Run? One of my favorite books of all time. But it's about God and how he pursues you. So what is God pursuing in you tonight? What is God pursuing for you? Is it that you become one of his children? I mean, is that where you are tonight? Yet to become a Christian? Maybe knowing the truth. Maybe having picked up his word and read it and maybe even being convinced of it. Why not? Why not repent of your sin? Confess that Christ is the son of the living God and go into the waters of baptism so you can come out that new creature, forgiven, found as all of these were. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you need prayers. What is God pursuing in you? Won't you come as we stand and sing?